Bezrat Hashem Nasev and Asliach, Orchus Yosheh and Ashkacha, Divine Providence. In every generation we have seen Ashkacha Pratis, Hashem's Providence, intervening on behalf of Tzadikim, rescuing them from all types of misfortune, and bringing blessings upon them, as it says in Tehillim 34.8, The Malach of Hashem encamps around His reverent ones, and He releases them. And... The Lubavitch Rebbe describes divine providence. He says, Particular supervision is manifest in an individual manner, even with wicked men. It is just that it is expressed and clothed and concealed in the garments of nature. Thus it is not obvious how every individual factor stems from God. God has not withdrawn his supervision, it is only that the overt and revealed expression of his supervision is hidden. Thus a man can convince himself that his difficulties just happen to befall him. That is, that they are part of the natural order, or a function of circumstance. In truth, however, every individual detail is controlled by a particular supervision of the supreme power. And the Ravad Yosef he explains that the Gentiles do not believe that there is divine providence upon every single person. They say, above all the nations is Hashem, upon the heavens is His glory. Tehillim 113.4 They think it is beneath His honor to pay attention to the lower world, to anything beneath the lofty malachim in the highest heavens. They think He is like a king of flesh and blood, who would only converse with the highest ranking officers. Now with a private, to refute, to refute this, David Melch says, Who is like Hashem our God, who lowers himself to dwell in the highest heavens? He also lowers himself to oversee the heavens and the earth. In Tehillim 113, 5 through 6. Hashem also must lower himself to relate to the Malachim, as they, no different from us, are merely his handiworks. The Gemara relates, Nachamish Gamzu was bedridden and was lying in a rickety, broken-down house that was in danger of collapsing. He instructed his disciples, My children, first take out the furniture and then take out my bed. For you may be assured that as long as I am in the house, the house will not collapse. Rav Huna had some wine in a rickety, broken-down house and he wanted to remove it before the house collapsed. He therefore brought Rav Ada Barahava into the house because Rav Huna was certain that as long as Rav Ada was in the house, it would not collapse. And so it was. The wine was removed. And then, after Rav Ada went out, the house collapsed. Two other such incidents are recorded in the Gemara. There was once a plague in Sura, the city of Rav. However, in Rav's neighborhood, there was no plague. People thought that the neighborhood was spared due to the great merit of Rav. It was revealed to them in a dream, however, that this was too small a matter to require Rav's merit, which was indeed very great. Rather, it was due to the merit of a certain man in the city who would regularly lend out his whole in hoe and shovel for use in burials. There was once a fire in Drokras, where Rav Huna lived. However, in Rav Huna's neighborhood, there was no fire. That is, miraculously, the fire did not spread there. People thought that the neighborhood was spared due to the great merit of Rav Huna. It was revealed to them in a dream, however, that this was too small a merit to require of Huna's merit, which was indeed very great. Rather, it was due to the merit of a certain woman in the city, who would heat her oven and make it available to her neighbors. Rabbi Y. Meltzen, of blessed memory, in the Siddur Hagara, writes about these two accounts in the Gemara. It would seem that the fact that these two sages had great merits should not be a relevant point. Was it because their merits were great that the neighborhoods were spared only due to the merits of simpler people? Due to this, he answers, in the name of the Yaros Devash and the Al Yaakov, that although our rabbis have taught us that once the force of destruction has been given permission to do damage, it will not distinguish between a tzaddik and a wicked man, in Bava Kama 60a, to whom does that apply? Only to individuals who are tzaddikim but still imperfect. But in the case of a person who is a complete tzaddik, such as Rav or Rav Huna, the force of destruction has no power over him. Even if the plague had spread to Rav's neighborhood, Rav would not have been harmed by it, since he was complete. He was a complete tzaddik. 
So there was no need to prevent the plague from entering the neighborhood merely to protect Rav. As it says in Tehillim 91.7, A thousand may fall victim at your side and a myriad at your right hand, but to you we will not approach. However, since the man who lent out his tools for burial did not have sufficient merit to be saved from the force of destruction if it had been allowed to enter the neighborhood, because he wasn't a complete tzaddik, it was necessary to save the entire neighborhood in order that that man be protected from harm. Similar concepts are found elsewhere in the Gemara. There was a certain woman who wanted to take dust from beneath Rabbi Hanina's feet for the purpose of using it to perform sorcery against him. He said to her, If you think you can succeed, go ahead and do it. I have no fear of you, for it is written in Divine 435, Eno Mavado, there is nothing besides him, besides HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara asks, But this is not so, for Rabbi Yochanan said, Why are sorcerers called Mechashvin? Because they weaken the upper legions. Mechashvin. Mechashvin. Pamaya. Shamala. This implies that sorcery does, in fact, have power to override heavenly decrees. And the Gemara answers, Rechenino is different, for he had great merit and had no reason to fear sorcerers. In 167b. There was a demon that lived in the study hall of Abaye's academy. The demon was so dangerous that even when people would walk to the base midrash in pairs, which provides a measure of protection, even in the daytime, which also provides a measure of protection, they would suffer injury. When Abaye heard that Rabbi Acha Bar Yaakov was coming to study under him, he arranged for Rabbi Acha to be forced to spend the night in the base of midrash by seeing to it that he had no other accommodations. Abaye was certain that in Rav Acha's merit, the demon would be killed, and so it occurred. That's found in Kedushin 29b. We find the same phenomenon among sages who lived in the post-Talmudic era. Otsumi Drashim, page 336, records an incident involving Rabbi Yehuda Achasid. One time a certain Gentile was attempting to kill Rabbi Yehuda Achasid, and the Gentile s- stuck his head out of a window. The window then closed down his head and he was not able to escape. See there for elaboration. Likewise in Seder Adoros, year 4865 since creation, an incident is related concerning Rashi. In that incident as well, a Gentile was attempting to kill him, and miraculously the Gentile could not see Rashi. Rashi became invisible to his eyes. The entire story is cited there at length. The same held true in later generations. Another incident when the holy sage Rabbi Akiva Eger, Zechatzadik Libracha, once came to Warsaw, he paid a visit to the Rav of the city, the great sage Rabbi Zalman, Zechatzadik Libracha, author of Chemda Shlomo, and other works. As they were conversing, the woman came in crying, and she presented herself before these two holy sages. Her husband had converted to another religion a number of years earlier, may Hashem protect us, and he had refused to divorce his wife in accordance with Torah law, leaving her unable to get remarried. The Chemda Shlomo had already invested a great deal of effort in attempting to resolve the situation, but he had not been successful. When this woman heard that the Rav of Posen, Rabbi Akiva Eger, was in Warsaw, she came before them with her distress, hoping that perhaps if two great sages of the generation would join forces, together they could find some resolution her strategy that would free her from the chains of being an aguna. Uh, an aguna is a woman that is perpetually bound in marriage. The husband with whom she no longer lives due to lack of a valid divorce or insufficient evidence that he has died. Nechemna Shlomo turned to Rabbi Akiva Eger and said, It is worthwhile for the Go'on to help this woman because she is in a very tragic situation. Rabbi Akiva, reply, Rabbi Akiva replied, Perhaps it could be re- arranged for this heretic to come before us. Much effort was expended to approach the husband's friends and acquaintances to appeal to them to persuade the husband to heed the summons of the rabbis. Why should you be afraid of these rabbis, his friends teased him. You can stick to your position and what can they possibly do about it? Finally, he agreed to go. When he arrived, Rabbi Akiva Eger asked him, Why do you refuse to divorce your wife? 
You are following the life that you chose for yourself, and that is your concern. But what have you against this poor, unfortunate woman? The heretic responded with disdain that he did not wish to free her. Rekiva Eger persisted. I heard it said in, that in your youth, you studied Gemara and Yeshiva. The man answered that this was true. Rekiva Eger then asked those who were there to bring him a Gemara Kedushin. He opened it to the beginning of the volume, pointed to the page, and said, Our sages have stated in the Mishnah, a woman may be acquired in marriage in one of three ways, etc., and she acquires herself back through divorce or through the death of her husband. You have a choice. Either give her a divorce, or if you do not want to do that, there is always a second option, the death of the husband. The apostate laughed derisively at Rabbi Akiva Eger's words and walked out. As he left the house and began descending the stairs, his vision grew blurry. Then everything went black as without warning he had a stroke. Falling down the stairs, he met his end then and there, and it was recognized as an obvious miracle. That's from Igor's Sofrim note to letter 43. Another such incident appears in the new edition of Shema Gedolim. When the Chida, Zechot Tzadik Libracha, was in his later years, he, li- he was in the city of Livorno, and a prominent individual came to him with a problem. His wife had been alone with a certain man, and her husband suspected his wife of infidelity. The official judges of the city were also present at this meeting. The Chida told the man, According to the dictates of the Torah, you are required to divorce her. The judges could not restrain themselves, especially because the woman in question was a relative of theirs, and they were anxious to defend her. They said to the Chida, Please teach us, our master, what is the rough source for such a ruling that he finds this woman guilty without witnesses? These can only be words of, Nevu- of Nevuah, and halakhic matters are not decided based on messages from heaven. If a verdict is going to be reached on the basis of Ruach HaKodesh, it will surely result in a wrong judgment, because on account of our many shortcomings, we do not merit having Nevi'im in our times. We can only judge in accordance with the words of our sages, which are founded on our Holy Torah. The Chida did not respond to them. He merely repeated to the husband, Listen to what I have told you, and divorce this woman. When the judges saw that the Chida would not listen to them, they went to some of the wife's other relatives, who were well-respected members of that community, and gave a full account of all that had transpired. The family caused the whole city to protest against the Chida's decision. When he heard about the controversy, the Chida felt the spirit of Hashem come upon him. He summoned the woman to appear before him. She came to the attic apartment, the room where he spent his time learning and praying. When he saw her, the Chida rose from his chair, went to the Aron Kodesh and removed the Torah scroll. Then he read from it so that she could hear the passage that describes the procedure of the Sota, the wife who was suspected of being unfaithful to her husband, with the proper cantillations. As she turned to leave, the sage proclaimed aloud, If you have not strayed, etc., but if you have strayed, etc., from the Midbar 5, 19-22, as soon as the woman put her foot on the top step, before she even had a chance to descend, her face turned green and her eyes began to bulge, and all the curses that are written in that passage were fulfilled. Her shrieking was heard from afar, and the judges and many of the townspeople came running to witness the awful scene. They were gripped with fright, and they cried, Take this cursed woman outside and remove her from the premises, so that she may not defile our master's house. Then they said to one another, Now we know that the Chida is a holy man of God, and the word of Hashem that is in his mouth is true. From that time on, people approached the Chida with trepidation, and he acquired a reputation as a man of wonders. In order to commemorate this event, the philanthropists in the community had the stairs where the woman died plated with gold, so that all should remember the awesome sage and the miraculous incident. And I have heard, Rav Chaim Kanievsky says, that those gold-plated stairs remained in existence until the last World War. I heard from my brother-in-law, Rukhan Kanievsky says, Rav Shaul Barzam, Zeich Tzadik Yibracha, that the Chazanish told him that until this generation, everyone saw the divine providence that was enjoyed by the great individuals among Israel. The Chazanish then related some examples. It is known that the Gentile neighbors of the sage Rabbi Eliezer Moshe of Pinsk, Zeich Tzadik Yibracha, used to beg him to walk across their fields because they all knew that any field he walked across would be blessed. In a city where the Minsker Gadol resided, there were ferocious dogs that would attack anyone who approached them, 
when the Mr. Guttle would walk by, the dogs would run in the other direction. And this was and this miraculous phenomenon was famous throughout the city. It is only in this last generation that this special providence has been withdrawn. It would seem that the reason for this is in order to increase our challenge of faith in the last days before the arrival of Mashiach. Nevertheless, someone who wants to see it will see it even today. The Chazanish then related that when he was in Minsk during the world during the war, the World War I, he had no passport. Anyone there who was caught without a passport was shot dead immediately. Once he was caught without a passport, and was, once sorry, once he heard the sol that soldiers were coming to the city to make a search, and he set out to flee from the city. But by mistake, instead of running away, he ran straight toward where the soldiers were stationed. He came upon the soldiers standing in two rows, and he passed by them right between the rows. Not one of the soldiers said a word to him, and he kept on walking until he was past them, and from there to the outskirts of the city. He said that the entire time he felt secure that no harm would befall him, because he had recently finished writing his safer in Erevin. There are numerous other accounts of this type of providence, which is provided for the great men of our people, testimonies from trustworthy, irrefutable witnesses, and whoever wishes to see examples of this can see them even today.